Hi everyone, this is Dr. Sandeep Sharma here. Welcome to the discussion where we'll be discussing pattern questions and uh, the overall recall related to need super speciality in pediatrics held in the month of January 2022. Uh, technically, it was held in 2022, but it is you know called as 2021 exam because it was postponed from the previous year to this year. So you can call it as 2021 or 2022. Uh, the purpose of this recall is not to, you know, make accurate or precise recall, which, which of course, if we are able to do, that is fine. But more importantly, you need to know what pattern was there, what kind of questions are being asked, and for your future exams, what are the takeaways. So whether you are a student who has appeared in the exam, or whether you are a resident who is due to appear in the future, this video is going to be extremely important. So before I start with the recall or discussion, there are uh, a few points about the overall assessment that I need to make, which are based upon inputs from the students have come. First of all, the standard of the questions was higher compared to previous need super speciality papers. If you look at papers of need super speciality in 2018 and 19, you will find that they were becoming more like, you know, glorified versions of need PG exam, the pediatric part, because uh, the level of questions was not very high compared to INI super speciality and EAM super speciality exams. But this time we found that the standard of questions was much better and only if you are well prepared in clinical scenario type of questions you could have got through in this paper. There were more clinical questions than before. Yes, there were one-liners but the number of clinical scenarios was much more. Uh, there were multiple topics having two or more questions. For example, tumor lysis syndrome had three questions. Allergy syndrome had two questions. Uh, spinal muscular atrophy had two questions and so on. So a bit of luck and a bit of, uh, you know, uh, if you have left out a certain topic and that topic, three questions were coming, it was going to play havoc with your result. So uh, a balanced approach was needed in such a paper. Then pediatric neurology questions were also asked. There were a lot of questions related to absence seizures, spinal muscular atrophy, muscular dystrophies, myotonic dystrophy. So uh, pediatric neurology is expected to be a game decider in the future exams as well. Then uh, there were a few rare and ambiguous questions, especially related to pediatric surgery, the things which are not directly mentioned or not directly discussed in most of the texts we have, we, we tend to do. So some pediatric surgery aspects also need to be done for future in your exams, in your exam preparation. Then uh, there was less focus on Nelson. When I say less focus, I am saying relatively. Overall general pediatrics and most of the specialities, almost 70 to 80 percent questions were from Nelson. But the reliance on Nelson was less in subjects like neonatology and pediatric nephrology where non-Nelson based things were also asked. So having this in mind, let us start with the discussion. Our disclaimer, focus of video is pattern of questions rather than actual MCQs. Any exact resemblance is purely coincidental, just like there is a disclaimer for biopics. So let us begin with question number one. EEG of a six-year-old patient is given below. The attacks are precipitated by hyperventilation and there is no post-ictal confusion. Mark the correct diagnosis. So they have made a clinical scenario and they have given a EEG-like picture. So even if you don't know how to read a EEG, still you can make the diagnosis. First of all, it is a six-year-old patient. It is not a newborn. Second is, there are seizures which are happening and attacks are precipitated by a hyperventilation. Very important clue. And there is no post-ictal confusion means the patient immediately resumes a normal thing, whatever he or she was doing before the seizure. Such a kind of picture is typically seen in patients with absent seizure. So even without looking at options, we can make the diagnosis that it is absence seizures, which is the likely diagnosis, right? Uh, if you have to read about EEG, how you are going to interpret this EEG? Very simple. First of all, you will find that there is a baseline pattern which was there. Suddenly, there was an interruption and an epileptic discharge happened. They have shown that the duration is one second for each column which is there, right? So what was the duration of the epileptic episode which happened, the seizure episode which happened? It was 1 second, 2 second, 3 seconds. So about 3 second was the duration following which immediately normal rhythm was, uh, normal background rhythm started. Then all the leads were involved. So all the leads were involved means there was a generalized seizure. So there was acute onset. Can you see that there is acute onset? It was a generalized seizure. Plus, what was the duration of episode? It was lasting about 3 seconds and immediately there was no post-ictal confusion. Question has already told you that it is a 6-year child and it was precipitated by hyperventilation. 
so everything is fitting into absence seizure and if you look at the seizure episode itself try to see if there is a spike and dome pattern also called as spike and slow wave pattern it is there or not look at uh, this this pattern look at this one where, where i am highlighting this if i try to show you this is the slow wave and this is the spike right this is your spike and this will be the slow wave which is there so try to see here you will find that there is one dome you will find that there is one slow wave two slow wave three slow wave one spike two spike three spike three spikes in one second are happening three spike associated with a slow wave this three spike and slow wave pattern is characteristic of absence seizure this is a patient with typical absence seizure so the likely diagnosis to this question is absence seizure so what are the key points about such seizure like questions that you need to know first of all whenever a question says that a seizure is precipitated by hyperventilation you should always think of possibly absence seizure as the likely possibility if you look at past papers you will find that these precipitating factors are very important clues in super specialty exams if the question says precipitated by awakening from sleep in a child who is less than 2 year old you will immediately think of infantile spasm as the likely possibility if the question says precipitated in morning hours with awake state and no post ictal confusion it is likely to be a myoclonic jerk in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy these myoclonic jerks will be a hallmark and they will occur in the form of frequent falling of objects occurring in the from the hands occurring in the morning hours so these are the three important clues for uh, clinical scenario based questions that you need to remember having knowledge about a particular topic is absolutely fine and you are supposed to do that but from mcq point of view each topic each uh, characteristic disease has a few points which are one liners it's like a treasure hunt if you have as a kid or even as a adult you play treasure hunt you know that if you are able to identify that particular hint you can easily reach your destination and the same holds true in mcq exams as well so whenever you revise after understanding the topic always highlight key points and try to do them as much as possible so answer to question number 1 is absence seizure right let us move to the next question question number 2 gene involved in the pathogenesis of pendred syndrome there were four options given some people said sir one option was slc 26a4 some people said pds gene so either of the two they are uh, alternative names of the same gene or same protein which are involved so the answer to this question obviously is a we have already discussed this in uh, in one of my videos where i had told you that uh, potential mcq on pendred syndrome is likely to be asked because pendred syndrome has already been asked once in ini Uh, in aim super specialty exam so uh, there is a possibility of this question coming over to neat ss and it did come over having said that i am no astrologer and i take no responsibility for questions getting predicted or not neither am i saying that uh, everything came from notes no i am not going to claim that but what is important is that anything which is important anything which has been asked in one exam has a high likelihood of being repeated either same or related to that question in the future exams as well so topics like pendred syndrome allergy syndrome down syndrome uh, pals guidelines they should be read thoroughly and even in the last week before you sit for your exam so what are the key points about pendred syndrome that you need to know it is a autosomal recessive condition the gene involved is pds gene which is present on long arm of chromosome 7 it codes for protein called as pendrin pendrin is also called as slc 26a4 so pds gene is also called as slc 26a4 gene this pendrin protein or slc 26a4 protein transports iodide as well as chloride it is also expressed not only thyroid but also in the cochlea that is inner ear and so these patients if this protein is deficient or mutated you will not only have hypothyroidism but you will also have sensory neural hearing loss 
So deficiency leads to impaired iodide organification leading to congenital hypothyroidism and it also shows sensory neural hearing loss in these patients. So combination of congenital hypothyroidism with sensory neural hearing loss is Pendred syndrome. There is a diagnostic test for this called as positive perchloride discharge test. Details of this test I have discussed in other videos and treatment of this is levothyroxine. Obviously for sensory neural hearing loss you need to refer the patient to uh, ENT department. So question number two the answer is A. Let us move to question number three. A relatively easy one. Baby presented with nodules, mass in abdomen, hypertension, diarrhea, periorbital edema. Some people said it was echimosis. X-ray shows calcification. What is the likely diagnosis? Now you can easily rule out D and A option. It is B and C where we will be stuck. The keywords here are first of all nodules. Nodules are common in neuroblastoma. Secondly, the hypertension ca can occur in neuroblastoma due to release of vasoactive peptide. It can also be uh, uh, it can also be sometimes seen in Wilms tumor along with hematuria. Diarrhea is very frequently seen in patients of neuroblastoma. The reason for diarrhea in neuroblastoma is it occurs due to release of vasoactive intestinal peptide. So VIP secretion is responsible for producing diarrhea in the patient. And periorbital echimosis or edema will be again a feature of bony metastasis which will be seen in patients of neuroblastoma. Calcification can happen in both neuroblastoma or Wilms tumor but has been described more commonly with neuroblastoma. In fact, if you read Nelson, Nelson talks about calcification only in neuroblastoma. It does not mention calcification in the chapter of Wilms tumor. So the likely diagnosis, everything pointing towards B that is neuroblastoma. For your exams, please remember neuroblastoma versus Wilms tumor will always be asked in some way or the other. Please remember that. This is something which you cannot let through. Question number four. Most common cause of a recurrent UTI in children. It's a one-liner already asked in the past. It is a repeat question. The answer to this is vesicouretric reflux. Vesicouretric reflux is responsible for 30 to 50 percent cases of a recurrent UTI if you look at various studies which have been done including those from India. So 30 to 50 percent of recurrent UTIs are contributed by VUR alone. So whenever a patient has recurrent UTI, you need to put the patient on antibiotic profile axis and you need to investigate for VUR by uh, the corresponding investigations which include MCU scan. Now question number five was a difficult question. A zygous vein is preserved during congenital tracheoesophageal fistula repair. What is the advantage of doing so? Here they are asking you about something which is controversial and these days a lot of research on this is going on. Uh, let us first try to understand what is tracheoesophageal fistula. It's a communication between uh, the airway and the esophagus. There are multiple subtypes. The most common variety which presents in the neonatal period is the one where there is a uh, proximal atresia and a distal fistula, right? It is also called as type C TEF. So in these patients, the patient will present with features of uh, respiratory distress, there will be abdominal distension, there will be extensive frothing from the mouth and urgent surgery will be indicated. So when you do surgery, what are the key points about surgery that you need to know? First, we'll summarize what do Nelson and Avery say about surgical management. They say that surgical ligation of TEF and primary end-to-end -end anastomosis of esophagus via right-sided thoracostomy, it constitutes the current standard surgical approach. In patients who are premature or have other complications or syndromic TEF, primary closure can be delayed by initially temporizing with the fistula ligation and gastrostomy tube placement. Definite surgery can be done later. Now, when you do surgery in these patients, there are some complications which occur. One complication of tracheoesophageal fistula surgery is gastroesophageal reflux. Right? So, there are some complications which are of TEF surgery that you need to know. Complications of TEF surgery include, first of all, the most common one is gastroesophageal reflux for which gastroesophageal reflux prophylaxis axis lifelong needs to be given. Secondly, many of these patients, a uh, few months to years later, they can develop tracheomalacia again which will which can be surgically managed when it happens and the third part which usually tends to occur early relatively early is anastomotic leak now anastomotic leakage is a major problem and can sometimes require resurgical approach or resurgery or second look surgery within the first few months of 
the surgery. So it is a relatively early complication. Now, a lot of studies have shown that if you do a zygous vein preservation during surgery, then the chances of anastomotic leak are reduced. But it's a complicated, it's a controversial area. Uh, there was a 2021, there was a recent meta-analysis published from India where they said that yes, a zygous vein preservation is beneficial, but it does not affect the anastomotic leak much. So, uh, let us try to see what two of the important publications are saying about it. First of all, you have this uh, publication which came in 2007 again from India where they talked about is zygous vein preservation and primary repair of esophageal atresia with TEF and it was a randomized control trial. They said that preservation of a zygous vein resulted in significant reduction. So, if you save a zygous vein, it resulted in significant reduction in the number of anastomotic leaks. We propose that preservation of a zygous vein prevents early postoperative edema of esophageal anastomosis by maintaining the venous drainage. So, a zygous vein preservation maintains venous drainage and by maintaining venous drainage, it reduces anastomotic leak. The controversy was this study, which was a meta-analysis published last year, again from India. It said that the surgical repair which of TEF, where a zygous vein preservation is done, it is superior in terms of there is reduced incidence of post-operative chest infection. However, there was no significant difference in the occurrence of anastomotic leak and structures that was seen. So, more randomized trials are needed, they said. What this study also said was that yes, a zygous vein preservation helps in ensuring that venous drainage from that area is sufficient. But whether that actually translates into reduction in anastomotic leak is still an area of active research. So, the examiner is not asking you a controversial area. What they are only asking you is, if you preserve a zygous vein in the surgical area, will it ensure good venous drainage or not? The answer is yes, it will. Now, look at the option. What is the advantage of doing so? Less recurrence? No. Prevent injury of thoracic duct? No. This will make future surgery easier? No. Good venous drainage of the repair area. Good venous drainage potentially can reduce anastomotic leak. We don't know, but good venous drainage will definitely happen and so this is the answer of choice. Difficult question, yes, but as I said, not every question is answerable, not every question is solvable. If you look at the uh, results of NEED super speciality, you will find uh, at the time of this uh, recording, the result is still not out, but uh, you will find that uh, topper will be able to get somewhere around 80%, but even the topper will not be able to answer all the questions and this is one of the areas where questions like these are difficult for pediatric medicine residents. Moving further, question number 6, again easy one. Baby presented with pain and mucus mixed with bloody discharge in stools. Baby was found to have a palpable mass near the umbilicus. What is the next investigation? First, you need to make the diagnosis. So, there is a baby, there is a young child. So, what are the features child is having? The child is having abdominal pain, child is having blood and mucus in stools. And the child on examination, the child is having a mass near umbilicus. Mass near umbilicus. If you see carefully, it is fulfilling the classic triad of intersusception. Although intersusception, the classic triad is seen in only about 30% patients. But still, the triad is being fulfilled here. In these patients, if you look at uh, the discussion which I have done in the discussion video, uh, I have explained that there is a palpable mass which is often found in the right um, uh, side of the abdomen with the axis being like this. In case Nelson also says that if it is palpable in the epigastric region, again axis will be transverse rather than being a uh, concavity towards the umbilical. So, this is the most common location where you will find the umbilical mass in these patients. So, what is the investigation of choice in patients of intersusception? The, this, is the, this is the way the question is asking. It is ultrasonography. Why? Try to see what Nelson says. Nelson says, the diagnostic findings of intersusception on ultrasound include tubular mass and longitudinal views and a donut or target appearance in transverse images. Ultrasound has a sensitivity of 98 to 100 percent and a specificity of 98 percent in diagnosing intersusception. It is easily available. It is non-invasive and it has uh, uh, sensitivity specificity about 98 percent or greater. So, what do, else do you need? The investigation of choice in this patient. So, what is the diagnosis? It is intersusception, 
and the investigation that you would like to do is ultrasound abdomen. So question number six, the answer is B, USG abdomen. Question number seven, when should you operate an inguinal hernia in children or infancy? Indirect repeat question asked some years back. Inguinal hernia, whenever it is diagnosed in children, it needs to be operated. That is the cardinal rule. Nelson says, presence of inguinal hernia in pediatric age group constitutes indication for operative repair. If it is there, you have to operate it. Why? Because an inguinal hernia does not resolve spontaneously and prompt repair eliminates the risk of incarceration and associated potential complications, particularly in the first 6 to 12 months of life. So it should be operated whenever it comes to medical attention and approach emphasizing prompt elective repair in infants is warranted. So the answer to this question, after 6 months, no. Around 2 years, no. After 5 years, no. As soon as it is diagnosed, you should operate it. Next question, question number 8, new unit presented with left sided diaphragmatic hernia, what is the immediate next step in management? Such type of questions are very frequently asked uh, and if you have prepared well, if you remember NEET PG also you used to get such questions in the exam. So let us come back to this question and try to understand what are the things that you should know. So whenever there is a newborn who is presenting to you with scaphoid abdomen with or without mediastinal shift you should suspect congenital diaphragmatic hernia, right? This is in newborn. Now, whenever you suspect CDH, there will be two possibilities. CDH is symptomatic. That is, the patient is having a respiratory distress. If the patient is having respiratory distress, this is a decompensated form and the first step to be done is intubation in the child. You do intubation and put the patient on positive pressure ventilation and shift the patient to conventional ventilation. You don't start the patient on ACMO or uh, high frequency ox oscillometric ventilation. You start on conventional ventilation. I hope you already know that bag and mask ventilation is contraindicated in these patients, right? So you will intubate and start on PPV. After intubation, you will put a nasogastric tube and decompress the stomach and do negative decompression. And then once the patient is stable for more than equal to or more than 48 hours, you will plan surgery in the patient. Surgery should never be done in CDH in an acute decompensated stage. There is a very high mortality. So emergency surgery will never be the answer in patient of CDH. Please remember that. In case it is an asymptomatic condition or prenatally diagnosed condition, where there is no distress. In these patients, you will not intubate directly. What you will do is, you will, the first step you will do is, put a nasogastric tube and keep the upper end open. This will allow the, all the secretions and air in the stomach to, to get decompressed. And you will not do an active decompression. You will insert a nasogastric tube. You will stabilize the patient. You will monitor. And again, you will do surgery only when the patient is stable for equal to or more than 48 hours. Understood? So, in case the patient deteriorates, obviously, then you, you can go in for intubation, conventional ventilation, that also fails. You go in for ECMO, uh, uh, high frequency ventilation, ECMO, you can give a trial of inhaled nitric oxide, you can give a trial of sildenafil, all these things I have, I have discussed elsewhere. But the related to the question, the next step is being asked and this is the point that you need to know. Let us look at the question now. What is, they are not saying the patient is having any uh, respiratory distress or not. So we assume it is not there. Even if it is there, there is no option of intubation here. So wait and watch. ICD placement, nasogastric tube insertion and stabilization, immediate surgery. Immediate surgery will never be the answer. No role of ICD placement. Wait and watch. Wait and watch means you are not doing anything. That is wrong. It can be a potentially problematic thing. So nasogastric tube insertion and stabilization will be the answer of choice. Let us move to question number 9. Three-year-old male patient has history of prolonged jaundice with failure to thrive. On examination, there is presence of a heart murmur and there is triangular facies with a pointed chin. What is the most likely diagnosis? So what are the things here? There is hepatic involvement in the form of jaundice. There is cardiac involvement in the form of a congenital heart disease and there is abnormal facies. The abnormal facies is in the form of a triangular face. All of this is typically fitting into a diagnosis of Ehlers-Ehlers syndrome. 
in fact allergenic syndrome has been asked so many times in super specialty exam i had told you that in my video discussions that there is a very good possibility of allergenic syndrome being asked again uh, just to highlight that point in the video discussion i have mentioned about dysmorphic facies as a likely mcq to be asked in your exam and i have also shown a image of how a triangular face in these children looks like again what are the key points related to allergy syndrome that you should remember allergy syndrome should be suspected when there is a genetic mutations compatible with allergy syndrome jagd1 or notch2 mutation plus any 3 out of 5 features are present what are the 5 features there are 5 types of manifestations that you need to remember first of all there is hepatic hepatobiliary involvement which occurs in the form of paucity of bile duct which can lead to neonatal jaundice and this jaundice can be can extend into infancy also so prolonged jaundice can happen secondly you will find that these patients have abnormal face the typical triangular facies is a manifestation of allergy syndrome i'm doing a very rapid review of allergy syndrome third these patients tend to have a congenital heart disease the most common congenital heart disease is it is our neat ss question already asked two years back most common congenital heart disease in allergy syndrome it is pulmonary valvular it is pulmonary stenosis pulmonary artery stenosis is more common then valvular stenosis then you have uh, other manifestations other congenital heart diseases which are common then fourth is your bony defects or vertebral defects the typical bony defect you find in these patients is butterfly vertebra and then you have ocular abnormalities or eye abnormalities in eye abnormalities the typical eye abnormalities include posterior embryotoxon which refers to thickening and anterior displacement of the schwalbe's line at the iris and cornea junction some patients can have a axenfeld anomaly also called as axenfeld regular anomaly and uh, anterior chamber abnormalities can also be seen so these are the five cardinal systemic involvement associated with allergy syndrome allergy syndrome had two questions so if you were thorough with allergy you had plus 2 if you skip this topic you were in trouble so answer to question number 9 obviously it is allergy syndrome the question number 10 again it's uh, allergy syndrome so let us read the question first six month old baby failed to thrive posterior embryotoxon right uh, ocular abnormality butterfly shaped vertebra which of the following heart defect is most commonly associated so diagnosis allergy syndrome and answer will be peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis so answer to this question is a question number 11 there was one question on the inflammatory mediators which are upregulated in nec the exact options could not be recalled so based upon avery nelson and uh, if you look at the standard textbook that is cloherty uh, there are some inflammatory mediators that you need to know necrotizing enterocolitis is considered to be a pro inflammatory condition right so in these patients there are a few things which are upregulated and few things which are downregulated so first of all the most important thing is there is upregulation of toll like receptor 4 so toll like receptor 4 also short written as tlr4 expression is increased second important thing which is increased in these patients are the circulating platelet activating factor levels are elevated the hydrolyzing enzyme of platelet activating factor is down regulated due to inflammation and so the circulating paf levels are elevated this high paf has been theorized to play a role in the manifestations and necrosis and inflammation in nec thirdly you will find that there is elevation in interleukin 8 levels and interleukin 18 levels right but there are these are the things which are increased there are two things which are decreased that you need to know first thing is there is decrease in the number of fox 3 p plus regulatory t cells in the intestinal mucosa they are regulatory t cells and they have a role in controlling inflammation in the intestine their levels are reduced and secondly there is a thing which is newly added in every can be a potential mcq in future heparin binding 
epidermal growth factor in short it is written as hbegf these are reduced in patients of nec in fact how breast milk protects against nec there are multiple ways one of the way is breast milk contains high amounts of heparin binding egf and by compensating for the low levels in a pro inflammatory state in premature newborns it tends to increase uh, to reduce the chances of nec in the patient so all these things are increased these two things are decreased based upon what is being asked in the question you can easily answer it let us move towards question number 12 baby presents with a thickened bladder with bilateral hydronephrosis a keyhole sinus ultrasound is seen what is the best investigation to diagnose this condition so first is you need to know what is the what need to make the diagnosis what is the diagnosis in this patient uh, bilateral hydronephrosis bilateral hydronephrosis basically means your obstruction of the uh, is happening at the level of bladder or urethra that is it is not at the level of pu junction it is at the level of bladder or below that and the keyword here is keyhole sign keyhole sign is diagnostic of posterior urethral wall posterior urethral wall is a common cause of bladder outlet obstruction especially in male infants so diagnosis in this is uh, posterior urethral wall and what is the best investigation for that you need to do a uh, after ultrasound has already been done so micturating cystourethrogram needs to be done so answer to this question is c and if you want to think how a uh, keyhole sign will look like keyhole sign uh, refers to a distended thickened bladder with there is small narrowing and then there is dilatation of the posterior urethra so a uh, appearance like this is produced this is the dilated bladder then there is a small narrowing and then there is posterior urethra which is again dilated so this appears like a keyhole and that is what you call as keyhole sign in posterior urethral wall so diagnosis is posterior urethral wall investigation to do is mcu Question number thirteen. Most common cause of chylothorax in children. It's a one-liner. Most common cause is post-surgery. Nelson clearly says that Fontan surgery or Fontan operation is a post-Fontan operation. Chylothorax is seen to happen most commonly. Other than that, it can happen due to trauma. It can happen due to birth injury. It can happen due to lymphoma also. Lymphoma, you can remember that it is not the most common cause, but it is the most common malignant cause. of chylothorax in children so if they ask most common malignant cause of chylothorax it will be lymphoma if they ask most common infectious cause of chylothorax it will be tuberculosis followed by histoplasmosis both of them according to nelson are rare causes but in a our country and uh, in the southeast asian countries they are still relatively common so answer to question number 13 is c post surgery question number 14 typical question you expect a uh, baby with non venous vomiting visible gastric peristalsis what is the electrolyte imbalance typical diagnosis likely diagnosis congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis what is the abnormality you will find there is multiple vomitings loss of gastric juice leads to alkalosis loss of chloride leads to hypochloremia initially very uh, early stages you may find mild hyponatremia but because of uh, hyperaldosteronism there is uh, you know uh, sodium levels are relatively preserved and potassium levels may become low so you will find hypokalemic hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis in these patients so you will find hypokalemic hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis if they ask you about sodium usually sodium levels by the time child comes to medical attention they are relatively normal but in a few patients with early presentation mild hyponatremia may be seen but it is not considered to be a characteristic abnormality it is more considered to be an exception so question number 14 the answer is b question number 15 in case of congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis what is the ideal replacement fluid this question seems to be taken directly verbatim from oxford textbook of uh, pediatric git there is also a shorter version of that oxford handbook of pediatric git where they have talked about all these details so let us summarize all these details here let us see what oxford textbook uh, talks about it so in patients of chps the initial management is nasogastric decompression that uh, you use size 8 french catheter in a term infant iv fluid resuscitation is required to correct metabolic disturbance before surgery or anesthesia initial iv fluids are first of all look at the amount 150 ml per kg per day 
Once the acid base status has been restored, you come to 100 ml per kg per day, right? And what is the fluid to be used? Half normal saline with 5% glucose with 10 millimoles of KCl per 500 ml. This is the composition that you are supposed to remember. In case half normal saline is not available, some books say that normal saline with 5% glucose can also be used, particularly if the patient is having mild hyponatremia. But other than that, in case sodium is within normal limits, as you find in most of these patients, then half normal saline with 5% glucose and 10 millimole of KCl should be added. Please remember that KCl should be added after ensuring that, that urine output only if urine output is maintained. Otherwise, giving KCL can cause dangerous sudden hyperkalemia in the patient. And definite treatment is by Ramstedt's pyloromyotomy. It is never an emergency. Surgical approach is sobra, umbilical incision or laparoscopic surgery can be done. So, the very important table, you should add it to your existing notes. Question number 16. A 5-year-old child had uh, easy question. Trauma in the epigastric region, following which he complained of abdominal pain radiating to back. Think of pancreas. Vomiting episodes, now abdominal mass which will develop few days to weeks later. What is the likely diagnosis? The only pancreatic condition here, pseudocyst pancreas. Nothing much to discuss here. Now, question number 17, we don't have the options here. Size of nodules in micronodular cirrhosis. If you look at most of the standard textbooks, they say that in micronodular cirrhosis, the size of the nodules is less than 3 millimeters. Whereas in case of macronodular cirrhosis, you will find that the size of nodules is greater than 3 mm, equal to or greater than 3 mm. So, it varies between 3 mm to up to 5 centimeters. So, 3 mm to 5 centimeters will be macronodular cirrhosis and micronodular cirrhosis size will be less than 3 millimeters. Again, answer will depend upon what is the closest option which is available. Point uh, I want to emphasize here, whatever things we are discussing is based upon the recalls. In case there is a alteration in recall or a certain value changes, the answer will also change because MCQ answers depend upon the options given and it also depends upon how the question has been framed. So there cannot be absolute one-liner answers here. This is all based upon whatever has been recalled and the purpose is to tell you the topics involved as I said before. So question number 18, not a component of the four score. Now four score is a, a, a score which does not include verbal response and so the answer to this question is C. There is eye response, there is motor response, there is brainstem reflexes and uh, breathing pattern, respiration pattern, whether intubated or not, is also taken into account. So, what are the key points about this that you need to know? First of all, four stands for full outline of unresponsiveness. So, full outline of unresponsiveness is technically called as four score. So, what are the parameters? There are four parameters here. First is the eye response. Second is motor response. Then we have brainstem reflexes and fourth is respiration. In respiration, 1 and 0 will be intubated patients and 2, 3, 4 will be non-intubated patients. And then we have the corresponding values. So, uh, four response details of this you need to, to do since we are doing a summary. So, I will not be going into the details of the four score here. So question number 19. Therapeutic levels of caffeine citrate in apnea of prematurity were asked. So, uh, what are the things that you need to know ca regarding caffeine citrate? You know that it is the drug of choice for maintenance therapy in apnea of prematurity newborns. It acts by adenosine antagonism. So, that is the one first thing that you need to know. Second thing is loading dose is 20 mg per kg and 24 hours later we start with the uh, subsequent maintenance dose which is 5 mg per kg per day. And uh, what are the therapeutic levels? Now, there is a slight variation in the therapeutic levels. If you look at Nelson, Nelson gives a value of 8 to 20 microgram per ml, whereas Cloherty gives a value of 5 to 20 microgram per ml. The upper cutoff is same in both, but the lower cutoff is uh, 8 in case of Nelson and 5 in case of Cloherty. It will not make much of a difference, but in exam, you have to mark whatever is the closest possible option. So, to avoid any ambiguity, I have given you both the values at single place, right? Next, we have question number 20, which was asked. The question was related to causes of false positive dipstick test in proteinuria. It is a repeat MCQ asked in super specialty exam. In NEET super specialty itself, it has been asked two times. AMS and PGI super specialty exams, it has been asked one time each. 
So it is a chronic repeat, repeating question. If you got it wrong, that is not the good thing because getting a repeat question wrong is not good. So what are the causes of false positive dipstick test in proteinuria? We don't have the options unfortunately, but there is a comprehensive list that you need to remember. On one side, we'll remember the false positive tests. False positive test for proteinuria in dipstick can be seen if there is a overly concentrated urine, especially if the specific gravity is more than 1.025. Alkaline urine, pH more than 7.0 will again give a false positive test. Contamination with blood will give you a false positive test. Contamination with urinary antiseptics like chlorhexidine will give you a false positive test. Please remember that this point is not mentioned in Nelson. But it has been asked in need super specialty past papers. And hematuria and pyuria can give a false positive test. Finally, prolonged dipstick immersion. You dip, dipped in urine and you for, forgot to take it out and you are checking after one hour. There may be a false positive test you may find. This will be uh, occurring due to leaching of the substrate, the, the agent which is there. And administration of radio contrast, penicillins and cephalosporins can also cause a false positive test. So these points are not mentioned in Nelson. You need to add it if you are preparing from Nelson. False negative test. Because it has been asked so many times, there is a good possibility it can be asked again also. So false negative test can be seen in dilute urine, overly dilute urine, acidic urine, pH less than 4.5, non-albumin urinary protein. Uh, you know that dipstick tests cannot, they are mainly uh, created to detect your albumin. So in case there is a non-albumin urinary protein, for example, Benz Jones proteinuria, that cannot detect, uh, that cannot always be detected in dipstick test or also a false negative test can be seen. Massive urine output like it happens in diabetes insipidus, it can cause a false negative test. Question number 21, identify the incorrect statement. So it was a very uh, controversial question. Again, answer can change depending upon how the options were framed. So the answer which I am giving here, I will be using references and it is based upon how the question has been recalled by people. If the actual options were different, the answer will change. Please remember that. So identify the incorrect statement. Let us look at the four options. These are the four options, right? So it is related to congenital heart disease. It was a tricky question. First option, furosemide is the first line drug in pediatric CCF. It is actually a true statement. If you look at Nelson, Nelson very clearly says that in most of these patients, furosemide is the initial therapy. Also, if you attend your pediatric cardiology clinics, you would know that furosemide, with or without digoxin, is often the first line agent that we start in most cases of CCF. Second point is ASD can lead to heart failure in 20 to 40 years. Atrial septal defect, if it is a large size and it is not closed, it is undetected, it can cause pulmonary hypertension, it can cause heart failure features beginning from second or third decade of life and often by 40 years. Option number C, hypoplastic left heart syndrome can cause CCF in the neonates. Many people said, sir, this is our incorrect statement. It is not an incorrect statement. It is actually uh, a very direct line mentioned in PARC that hypoplastic left heart syndrome can cause CCF within first week of life. It causes poor cardiac output but along with that, features of CCF have, have also been known to occur in these patients. TOF leads to CCF in children. When we say TOF, TOF is a condition with, tetralogy of fellow, is a condition with decreased pulmonary blood flow. Because of decreased pulmonary blood flow and uh, RV outflow obstruction, you find that features of CCF are relatively rare. Plus, you also find that there is no stage in TOF that there is increased chamber pressures or increased chamber volume sustains in the cardiac cycle. And that is why congestive cardiac failure does not happen normally in tetralogy of fellow. In fact, there is a old saying that which heart disease has least risk of CCF? The answer is always tetralogy of fellow followed by atrial septal defect. Now you may say, sir, uh, we have heard, we have read that certain conditions, uh, CCF can develop in TOF. Yes, it can. But those will be additional pathological conditions complicating TOF. By TOF itself, CCF is not seen. For example, in case there is a high-grade fever or the patient is having additional aortic regurgitation, these patients can develop uh, CCF in TOF. In case there is a thyrotoxicosis, beriberi, uh, volume overload, uh, arterioventricular, AV fistula, all these conditions where hyperdynamic state is produced, you can find CCF to develop in TOF. But by itself, TOF does not cause CCF in children. And this is the answer of choice. 
So they are asking the incorrect statement. The answer is D. TOF leads to CCF in children. Let us look at. I know many of you will not be satisfied. So have a look at what Nelson and Park say. Nelson says very clearly. Furosemide is the most commonly used diuretic in pediatric patients with heart failure and then it talks about its mechanism etc. Then this is what uh, Park talks about ESD. If a large defect is untreated, CHF and pulmonary hypertension begin to develop in adults who are in their 20s and 30s and becomes common after 40 years of age. So option B is also correct. Option C, it is a true statement. Option C, they are talking about natural history of hypoplastic left heart syndrome in Park. Park says pulmonary edema and CHF develop in the first week of life. Circulatory shock and progressive hypoxemia and acidosis result in death usually in the first month of life. So what we are left with? D option. That is your answer of choice. Next is question number 22. There was a case, clinical case on burdening Hoffman disease. Now the options have not been recalled but I will try to summarize the key features of burdening Hoffman disease here. What is burdening Hoffman disease? It is nothing but spinal muscular atrophy type 1 is called as Werdening Hoffman disease. It is a type of neuronopathy that is there is death of anterior motor neuron cells supplying the skeletal muscles. So there is progressive denervation of this skeletal muscle. It is an anterior motor neuron defect. Uh, it was originally described by uh, Austrian physician Werdening and a German physician Hoffman in 1890s. So, so early back. So it is called as Werdening Hoffman disease there are multiple subtypes of SMA most common is SMA type 1. So what are the key points about this that you need to know? First is it is also called as congenital SMA or type 1 SMA. This is most common please remember that it is about 60 to 70 percent of all SMAs. It occurs due to SMN1 gene mutation present on 5 to 13. SMN1 stands for survival motor neuron 1 gene. SMN1 produces a protein which is involved in preventing the apoptosis of anterior motor neuroblast. In case SMN1 gene undergoes mutation, the protein is not produced and so there is death of neurons leading to the disease manifesting. There is also a sister gene of this called as SMN2. SMN2 is usually non-functional or very low functional activity is there. It only produces 5 to 10 percent activity is there. It produces a small amount of protein. The reason it is not functional is because there is a uh, exon 7 defect which is present in SMN2 and because of that exon 7 defect there is a C to T transversion and because of that SMN2 is a non-functional gene. But because SMN1 is functional in you and me it does not cause any problem. In patients of uh, SMA SMN1 stops functioning. It is an autosomal recessive condition by allelic mutation leads to the development of burning Hoffman disease. So features uh, SMN2 copy number will be 1 to 2 in 80 percent of the patients. It is found that patients who have multiple copies of SMN2 the amount of functional protein will be relatively more and so they will be protected from the deleterious effects of SMA. They will have other types of SMAs like type 2, type 3, type 4 and so on. It's a complicated concept. I'm not going into details. You want to want me to discuss later on, we can always discuss it later on. But SMN2 copy number is very, very important. People tend to miss out. Nelson also talks about it in details in the table. Now, time of onset of burning of men disease is 0 to 6 months. There is severe weakness, proximal more than distal, upper, lower limb more than upper limb, and there is profound hypotonia. This hypotonia produces a floppy infant and results in a form of ragged doll appearance or there is a thing called as frog-like posture. You know frog-like posture, you know ragdoll appearance. So those are features seen in SMA type 1. There will be absent dependent reflexes, feeding difficulties and tongue fasciculations will be seen. Fasciculation is a sign of denervation. Intercostal muscles will be involved leading to paradoxical breathing and poor cough. It spares extraocular muscles, sphincters and diaphragm. And cause of death is respiratory failure and respiration pneumonia. Most of them die by 2 years of age. So it is a condition with poor outcome. So look at the options, whatever are the options, you need to make the diagnosis based upon the options. So they will have children with onset of illness in less than six months. There will be progressive hypotonia and features that have been explained. Question number 23, it was related to SMA. So there were two questions on SMA. Drug useful in SMA. Now answer to this question is nucinersin. Nucinersin is also known as Spindrazen. What is nucinersin? See, let us try to understand it in a conceptual form. 
when you have to talk about treatment of SMA other than the supportive therapy. Now, what is the reason for SMA? SMN protein is not getting formed. So you can do two things. Either, there are two approaches. You can either restore functioning of SMN1. How you can do it? SMN1 has undergone mutation. So what you will do is, you will insert a new SMN1 gene which is functional using adenoviral vector. The name of the adenoviral vector which is used, it is a type of gene therapy. It is called as AAV9. This is called as gene therapy. Still in nascent stages, still not commercially available. So this is one way you can treat SMN1. Second way of treating is, you remember SMN2 was there. But it was not producing much protein. You increase the function of SMN2. And how will you do that? SMN2 is normally present in you and me. But it is, you know, like a sleeping giant. How will you increase its activity? You will increase its activity by exon, also called as splicing manipulation. And that therapy is called as Antisense oligonucleotide therapy. Antisense oligonucleotide therapy. Antisense oligonucleotide, which has been FDA approved for management of SMA, is this agent that is mucinase. Right? To explain it better, let me try to explain with a very simple example you will always remember. There are there is a family in which there are two twins. The elder twin is the earning member, responsible member. He goes out, he earns almost uh, uh, 80, 90 uh, thousand rupees per month and he is the one who is doing all the activity. He is earning whatever resources for his family. He has a second twin who does not do anything. He sits at home. Sometimes he creates a YouTube video. Sometimes he creates something else and he earns, you know, four, five thousand rupees per month. It is not sufficient to carry on the family but because the elder brother of him, of his, is able to work, so he is able to, you know, continue with his daily lifetime. Now imagine, the, in a road traffic accident, the earning member dies. So what will happen? Now, the amount which this second twin is earning, he does not have the resources, he does not have the capacity to immediately start earning as much as before. And so, there will be poverty, there will be fragmentation of the family. This is what happens in a condition called as SMA also. So what you can do? What you can do is uh, how you can save the family by training this person and making him work better. This is wh what we are going to do with mucinarsum antisense oligonucleotide therapy. You will identify why this person is not working and you treat that the person will start working. It will take over the family. The family's finances will be restored. Look at this. SMN2 gene. Why it is non-functional? I told you. There is a exon 7 which has a thymine residue. Normally there is cytosine here in SMN1. Here there is a thymine residue. Because of it, it is non-functional. Because of this thymine residue, it becomes predisposed to intronic splicing suppressor which is present just after exon 7. It is This is intron 7. Intron is the non-coding region. So, here this is responsible for inhibiting the exon 7. And this intronic splicing suppressor is responsible for exon 7 exclusion during mRNA formation. Now, when you give mucinersum, mucinersum goes and binds with this splicing suppressor and allows inclusion of exon 7 in the mRNA chain which is getting formed and so it will lead to a stable mRNA and consequent SMN functional protein formation leading to cure of SMA. So, this is the summarized form of what I have said. It is a tricky topic. It is a difficult topic. Lot of textbooks, lot of online sources say that exon 7 is skipped. That is wrong. Exon 7 is included by therapy. You want it to be included because it is getting skipped. That is why SMN2 is not functioning. You want it to get included and to make it included, we form an oligonucleotide which binds to its repressor and allows exon 7 to get included in the normal chain allowing functional protein. So that is the mechanism of mucinarsum. Why did I talk about it in so much of details? Why did I spend 5 minutes talking about it? 
you can for, it's a forward you can forward the video but this is important because nusi narsan has been asked multiple times in super specialty entrance exam so you understand it once you will understand it further now questions number 24 25 26 they have not been properly recalled but they are all related to the same topic so the topic was tumor lysis syndrome student said sir there was question on diagnosis criteria and treatment so let us briefly summarize tumor lysis syndrome so tumor lysis syndrome is a acute syndrome arising due to rapid release of intracellular metabolites when tumor cells die which uh, overwhelms the normal excretory capacity of the body now it can happen before the therapy also it can usually happens after chemotherapy is started more often it happens 12 to 48 hours after starting chemotherapy so this point can be asked in your exam right then metabolic complications what does tumor lysis lead to it leads to hyperuricemia it leads to hyperkalemia hyperphosphatemia hypocalcemia and acute renal failure with metabolic acidosis so complications associated have already been asked in aims super specialty exam 4 years back now what are the conditions associated with high risk of tls first category is nhl in which burkitt lymphoma and lymphoblastic lymphoma have a very high risk all where uh, tlc count is more than 1 lakh and aml patients with tlc count more than 50000 are the conditions which are categorized according to lenzowski as high risk conditions so this high risk categorization mein kya kya included hai it is very important it is given as a table in lenzowski now what is the diagnostic criteria you need to understand there are two types of diagnostic criteria lab criteria and clinical criteria both need to be remembered tricky but let us try to understand them first is laboratory criteria also called as laboratory tls if there are presence of two or more abnormal serum values at presentation which include uric acid more than 8 potassium equal to more than 6 phosphate equal to more than 2.1 millimol per liter calcium equal to or less than 1.75 or if there is a change in serum value by 25% within 3 days before or 7 days after initiation of therapy you say laboratory tls is present and what is clinical tls it should be ctls now clinical tls will be presence of ltls along with one or more of the following clinical features there should be renal insufficiency cardiac arrhythmias seizures or sudden death in the patient right now what is the management of tls aggressive hydration is needed total fluids two to four times of maintenance need to be given diuresis using low dose furosemide and manitol can be tried in unresponsive cases uric acid reduction again for the drug of choice for this is rasburicase please remember that allopurinol is not the drug of choice potential mcq point this is the dose and it is contraindicated in g6pd deficiency again a potential mcq alternative is allopurinol 200 mg per meter square per day i'll be dose leukocyte reduction will be needed in the hyperleukocytosis it can be done by fsis and transfusions will be needed in case the counts fall rapidly chemotherapy is started only once the patient is stable and urine output is liquid and finally brain imaging will be indicated in case there are cms signs and symptoms now let us move towards question number 27 microscopic albumin urea screening in type 1 diabetes mellitus should be started from according to the american uh, diabetic association guidelines they should be started in case of type 1 diabetes they should be started 5 years after diagnosis and in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus they should be started at the time of diagnosis should be done immediately so the options given were these so microscopic albumin urea screening in type 1 diabetes mellitus should be started 5 years after diagnosis so what does ada say american diabetic association says screening should be done in these patients for microalbumin urea on a yearly basis but when to start in case of patients of type 1 diabetes mellitus it should be started 5 years after diagnosis has been made and then you do it here in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus it is uh, started at the time of diagnosis and it is done here in this is right question number 28 what is the target hb level while transfusing using in acute splenic sequestration options given were 7 g per deciliter 8 g per deciliter 10 and 12 please remember that target hb level is it is clearly mentioned in all standard textbooks that it is around 8 g per deciliter uh, and i have already discussed this in one of my videos in discussions where i have mentioned that uh, 
target HB post transfusion is 8 grams per deciliter. So if your post transfusion value becomes 10 or more, it increases the risk of hyperviscosity syndrome in the patient. So answer to question number 28, it is B, 8 grams per deciliter. Question number 29, what is the predictor of mortality in pediatric acute liver failure? Again, the options are not available. It is also a very uh, complicated, it is a very uh, controversial question. So, we will discuss what the standard textbooks talk about. So, the answer as I said, it will depend upon the exact options given. As per Nelson 21st edition, the predictors of increased mortality in pediatric acute liver failure include, first of all, age less than 1 year, second is stage 4 hepatic encephalopathy, INR more than 4, prothrombin time more than 90 seconds, low factor 5 levels, need for dialysis before transplantation and plasma ammonia more than 200 micromoles per liter. So, if you look at these three options, they all refer to coagulopathy. So, presence of coagulopathy is considered to be a sensitive marker for predicting uh, mortality in the patient. Nelson also says that plasma ammonia more than 200 micromoles per liter increases mortality by 5 times. But it does not say that this is the most important thing. If you look at what Oxford textbook of uh, pediatric GIT says, Oxford uh, textbook of pediatric GIT, it says the prognosis of ALF varies greatly with the underlying etiology. Prothrombin time is the best predictor of survival. So, prolongation of prothrombin time, that is coagulopathy, is the most important predictor of survival and mortality. Factor 5 concentration has been used as a prognostic marker, especially in association with encephalopathy as a part of Clichy criteria. In children, a factor concentration, factor 5 concentration of less than 25% usually suggests a poor outcome. So again, answer will depend upon what options are given. If you have to choose one, prolongation of prothrombin time is the most safest answer if you have to choose one. Question number 30. Which among the following is the next investigation to perform in a child with suspected RBT? The options given were ultrasound, Doppler, MRI and radionuclide scan. Answer is not Doppler as you might think. Many people tend to think that in thrombosis, in vascular conditions, Doppler is more sensitive. That's true but not in case of RBT and that is why they have made this question. Let us look at what different textbooks say. Ultrasound shows, this is what is mentioned in Pediatric Nephrology by Dr. Arvind Bhaka, the standard textbook as well as Pediatric Nephrology, the international edition, they both say that ultrasound shows the affected kidney in RVT to be enlarged and uh, it maintains its reniform shape but there is diffuse altered eco texture, if there is compression of renal sinus echoes and there is poor corticomedullary differentiation. Why ultrasound is the screening test and not Doppler? Doppler studies may show normal flow in the renal veins, especially those associated with nephrotic syndrome, since the thrombotic changes start peripherally and propagate centrally. So, Doppler increases the yield of ultrasound, but by itself, it is inferior to ultrasound in RVT. Please remember that. CTAs, that is CT angiography and MR venography, are most sensitive and specific, but they are not given in the option. Radionuclide studies reveal information of prognostic significance with a normal study predicting a rapid and complete recovery. So, if you look at these options, the answer is very clear. The next investigation to perform in suspected RBT will be ultrasonography. Yes, it is not wrong. Question number 31. Clinical case, 12-year-old boy, large joints involved, fever for 3 months, significant weight loss, picture of an erythematous rash. Now, what is the di likely diagnosis? The options which were given were tubercular arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, systemic onset GIE, also called SUGIA, and IBD-associated arthritis. We are very clear it is not likely to be tubercular or psoriatic. Now, whether it is systemic onset GIE or IBD-associated arthritis, it will depend upon what kind of rash picture was given. See, in case the rash given was a salmon rash, salmon evanescent rash on the trunk, it is likely to be in favor of systemic onset GID, right? In case of IBD associated arthritis, you will find presence of erythema nodosum. So, if the rash was more like a nodular lesion or erythema nodosum, it will be in favor of IBD associated arthritis. Please remember that fever for 3 months can be seen in systemic onset GIE also, it can be seen in IBD associated arthritis also. Significant weight loss is more in favor of IBD associated arthritis but has been described in systemic onset GIE also. Large joint involvement again can be seen in both C and D. 12 year old boy again it can be either C or D option. If they had mentioned diarrhea, 
it would move in favor of IBD associated arthritis. If they had mentioned hepatosplenomegaly or serositis, the diagnosis would move in favor of systemic onset GIA. So answer will change if one word is changed, one word is added or one word is deleted, if the image which has been given to you changes. Since I don't have the image, so I will not take slide, I will just tell you how you are supposed to think and how you are supposed to prepare for your uh, exams in future. So answer is either C or D depending upon the information given in the question. Question number 32. Initial dose for synchronized cardioversion in supraventricular tachycardia as per PALS guidelines. Uh, it's a very simple thing. 0.5 to 1 joules per kg is the initial dose. Later on, it can increase to 2 joules per, uh, per kg or gram per, per kg in case there is no response. Question number 33. Now, again controversial question. Child with refractory rickets not improving on vitamin D values given were normal ABG, normal creatinine, normal calcium, normal PTH. Please remember normal calcium and normal PTH. They will help you in that uh, reaching the diagnosis. What is the next investigation to be done? Now, two options could be easily ruled out, but many people were stuck in 125 THCC and FGF23. The answer to this question is FGF23. Why not 125 DHCC? Let us look at what the different review articles say about approach to such questions. Now, whenever there is suspicion of rickets and uh, it's a, you know, there is no response to the patient, you, especially for refractory rickets, you will check for calcium levels, phosphate levels in the blood, ETH and calcidiol levels, right? 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. Now, in case there is increased PTH, normal to reduced calcium and reduced phosphate levels, you will call it as calcipenic rickets. In case of phosphopenic rickets, phosphate levels will be reduced. So, phosphate levels will be reduced in both. But the PTH levels will be found to be normal. Now, try to think what is there in this question. There are normal PTH levels. So, this is not calcipenic cricket. It is likely a phosphopenic cricket. How we are going to approach? Look at this. Calcipenic crickets, you will determine calcidiol levels. And based upon that, if it is reduced, think of nutritional crickets. If they are normal, you will determine calcitriol, that is 125 DHCC levels. If they are reduced, VDDR1. If they are increased, either calcium deficiency or VDDR2, you will suspect. But this is not the case here. What, what is the case here? We have phosphopenic rickets which is there because normal PTH. So, you will determine phosphate urea is present or not. In case phosphate urea, now phosphate urea as an option is not mentioned here. The next thing after that will be in case it is low, you will think of nutritional phosphate deficiency which is relatively rare. In case it is high, you will determine FGF23 serum levels. And because it is phosphopen looking like a phosphopenic rickets, according to the question, there are normal PTH level, FGF23 determination will help you in making the diagnosis. In case it is normal to low, you will have these possibilities. In case it is increased, then only you will do a determine calcitriol levels and try to find the answer. So according to this option, determining FGF23 is required. So what you need to remember is, in case you have a question of refractory rickets, and patient is having normal calcium and normal PTH. So whenever you have a normal PTH, the next investigation in these patients will be checking for renal phosphate excretion and doing a FGF23 levels. Whereas in case there are altered PTH levels, that is raised PTH levels, in these patients you will go in for checking for vitamin D levels. Initially, you will check for uh, calcidiol levels and then uh, afterwards you will do for 125 DHCC levels. Again, I can you can solve this question through the lateral route also by talking about the possibilities and looking at their investigations. But this is the uh, approach in which it is this question is likely to be answered. Tricky question, even if you got it wrong, it's okay. Questions like these do go wrong in Question number 34. Please remember that you are not supposed to know everything. Even the topper, eventual rank 1 will not know at least 10 to 15 questions out of the 100 questions which came in your exam. Right? Question 34. Four-year-old child with failure to thrive was diagnosed with ASD one year back. Now comes with lower respiratory tract infection which is a other name for pneumonia. Which of the following is an incorrect statement? Let us look at the options. Option A. Treat LRTA as per routine protocol. Obviously, pneumonia hai. You have to give antibiotic according to the protocol. So, this is a correct statement. Early closure of ASD is advised. Yes. Any symptomatic patient. Nelson clearly says it should 
in the preschool age child it needs to be closed before 5 years of age so this is a 4 year old child so early closure is advised now 2d echo can be repeated yes it can be repeated in case there is a lower respiratory tract infection catheterization is not needed but prior to because one year has already gone and you are planning a surgery so one pre operative echocardiogram will be needed for pulmonary vascular resistance various qp qs ratios etc those need to be calculated and for that a pre surgery echo will be needed because it is a old echo which has been done what is the left option look for other alternative causes of ftt what they are saying basically is asd cannot be the cause of ftt it is there when asd is there and it is associated with increased chest infections it means there is it is a hemodynamically significant asd it is a large asd there is a left to right shunt which is significant there is pulmonary blood flow which is significant and when you have a answer like this why would you rule out asd and look for other options so the by exclusion the incorrect statement among these four is d that is your answer and all this is based upon park and nelson question number 35 which is the glycogen storage disease with cirrhosis? I don't know whether it was a one-liner or a clinical scenario. Doesn't matter. Answer is type 4 GSD. What are the points to remember? GSD type 1, 3, 6 and 9 they showed hepatomegaly without cirrhosis. GSD type 4 develops micronodular cirrhosis. GSD type 2 shows cardiac involvement. And GSD type 5 and 7 show significant skeletal muscle involvement. Right? Question number 36. Half-life and duration of acetaminophen in premature infants. Some students said only half-life was asked. Same as adults, more than adults, less than adults. Be very clear. Acetaminophen, that is paracetamol, its half-life is more in premature babies as well as term babies. And that is why those duration needs to be less. Normally, we use paracetamol 4 to 6 hour day. But in infants, if you have to use it, the dose should be given at a gap of 8 to 12 hours. It is very clearly mentioned in average neonatology also. Every says... Pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic studies of acetaminophen in infants recommend less frequent enteral dosing intervals of acetaminophen every 8 to 12 hours in preterm as well as term units because of slower clearance times. Because of slower clearance time, the half-life will be more than adults. The answer to this question is more than adults. If you need further proof, there is a British medical journal summary of abstract which says the increased plasma half-life of 5.69 hours thus reflected normal slower metabolism in infants rather than toxicity. The toxic, so the plasma half-life of acetaminophen or paracetamol is increased more compared to adults. So it, the toxicity happens because half-life is less, not because of the hepatic enzymes not being there to take care of the medicine. Right? Question number 37. Ventilation strategy in CDH. Now, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, Nelson very clearly says the ventilator strategy is permissive hypercapnia. Permissive hypercapnic strategy, you allow hypercapnia in the range of PaO2, PaCO2 in the range of about 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury. You permit that, that is the gentle ventilation strategy recommended. So, Nelson says gentle ventilation with permissive hypercapnia reduces lung injury, need for ECMO, and mortality in CDH patients. Question number 38, there was a case scenario asked of a child undergoing road traffic accident and there was absent central pulses. This is important. Electrical recording of heart rate of 115 and ECG showing wide QRS, what next is to be done? We don't have the options. But central pulses are absent. ECG is showing activity that is pulseless electrical activity. Right? In pulseless electrical activity, it is you cannot give a cardioversion shock. It is a non-shockable rhythm. And so, what next is to be done? CPR is to be continued. Chest compressions need to be given in such a patient. So, remember, pulseless electrical activity is the diagnosis here. It is a non-shockable rhythm as per PALS and the CPR using chest compression needs to be started. And then, according to PALS, you can manage. And if chest compressions are not working and you have given it for more than 5 minutes, then obviously you need to go for medication. You need to rule out the other options of other causes of pulseless electrical activity. In a short, PALS protocol needs to be followed. So, what next is to be done? No, uh, CPR needs to be given. Question number 39. Reticulocytosis begins in how many days after initiation of therapy in iron deficiency anemia? There is a table in Nelson. It very clearly says it begins in 48 to 72 hours. If the question says peak kab hota hai, peaks at 5 to 7 days. Very frequently asked table. Question number 40. 
micro organism causing diarrheal infection and associated with iron overload states uh, it is given in nelson at one place as a one liner i had discussed this point in a promotional video also and it is there on the app video also answer to this is yersinia as you can see clearly here i have discussed that iron overload cirrhosis and chelation therapy if they are mentioned as risk factors the child has a high likelihood of developing diarrhea dysentery due to yersinia yersinia enterocolitica in case there is a dysentery mimicking ibd think of campylobacter jejuni and in case you are suspecting hemolytic anemia with bacteremia you should suspect non typhoid salmonella finally organisms which show vertical transmission producing perinatal diarrhea they include shigella non typhoid salmonella and campylobacter these are all points discreetly mentioned in nelson in the chapter of diarrhea but uh, they all this has now been asked as a, as a exam question and this is, was a statement based question asked some years back in pgi super specialty exam it is no longer held but still iniss is there so you need to remember these key points question number 41 one question was related to acute promyelocytic leukemia with dic treatment will be you know that oral tretinoin is the drug of choice it is also called as etra and it acts by inducing the differentiation of leukemic cells with transportation 1517 if etra is not available the alternative agent is arsenic trioxide it is also written as as2 3 alternative agent drug of choice is this one Question number forty-two: Bouquet of flowers appearance on IVP seen in MSK and MCKD, and there were other options. We don't need to go further. Medullary sponge kidney is the answer to this question. As you can see, pathognomic features on investigation are also being very frequently asked. This is how a bouquet of flower appearance on IVP will look like. There will be dilated ectasias. in which calcium deposits will happen and so it will appear like a bouquet in which flowers are you know protruding out so this is the typical bouquet of flower appearance seen on ibp question number 43 barter syndrome subtype associated with sensory neural hearing loss type 1 2 3 and 4 see there are multiple subtypes of barter syndrome their characteristic feature their inheritance and their what is the genetic abnormality in each needs to be done in details i am not going into detail i'll show you just a simplified table here these are the five types of barter syndrome that you need to know first is the type 1 barter syndrome which is autosomal recessive type 2 is also autosomal recessive type 3 is the original classic barter syndrome that we described type 4 is the hyper pg syndrome type trans 5 is the transient barter syndrome all of them are autosomal recessive except type 5 which shows x linked recessive inheritance and it is the hyper pge syndrome that is type 4 which is the one which is associated with sensory neural hearing loss so answer to this question is d that is type 4 question number 44 again there was a case of barter syndrome and treatment had been asked now we don't have the options but what you need to know regarding the treatment of barter syndrome first thing supportive therapy is the mainstay there is no wonder drug available uh supplementation of potassium and sodium is needed in most of the young children in addition in case hypomagnesemia is present you need to give magnesium supplementation only if it is present otherwise it is not needed and some patients respond to indomethacin as well question number 45 case of 8 year old child was there with esophageal varices normal ast no hepatomegaly but splenomegaly was present what is the likely diagnosis so whenever uh, you have very severe varices with portal hypertension but normal liver function tests and normal liver imaging always think of two conditions there are two possibilities one is extra hepatic portal venous obstruction and second is non cirrhotic portal fibrosis please remember that ehpbo is a disease of children whereas ncpf is a disease of adolescents and adults in fact adults are more frequently affected than adolescents so we do not have the options here but from what the information has been given it looks very likely to be a case of ehpbo again if there is some additional thing given the answer will change if based upon this uh, scenario if it is given even if i don't have the option i will only think of ehpbo as the answer if ehpbo is not there age is slightly older you can even think of ncpf as the second likely possibility question number 46 case of neonatal jaundice was there ultrasound finding findings were fibrosis at portahepatitis and hepatic gallbladder what is the surgery of 
choice. This is atritic gallbladder, ultrasound finding of porta hepatitis fibrosis, neonatal jaundice. The likely diagnosis in these patients is biliary atresia. And what is the surgery of choice in biliary atresia? It is Kasai's surgery, also called as Kasai's portoentrostomy. It is always effective if it is done within less than before three months of age. If you do it later, the outcome may not be great. Biliary atresia, if Kasai portoentrostomy is late or not effective, obviously the end result, all of these patients, you need to go in for liver transplant. Also remember the MCQ one-liner already asked in the need super specialty. Biliary atresia is the most common pediatric indication for liver transplantation. Question number 47. Dive bomber sounds on EMG. I know it is a tricky thing, but dive bomber sounds. EMG, you not only see the graph, but when EMG is getting recorded, you also hear the EMG sounds. And there is a typical uh, waxing and waning course of amplitude as well as frequency which is suggestive of myotonia. Myotonia is classically present in patients of myotonic dystrophy. So answer is myotonia in myotonic dystrophy. So dive bomber sound kya hote hai? They are a typical acoustics. Acoustic is something you hear which occur due to occurring due to increase and decrease in the amplitude and frequency on EMG and they are suggestive of development of myotonia in patient of myotonic dystrophy. There are other causes of myotonia, there also you may find a similar pattern, right? Question number 48, micro deletions in chromosome 7. Again, we don't know what the options were, but elastin gene micro deletions on 7 to 11.23 produce William syndrome. That is all you need to know. Question number 49. Initial dose of adenosine in a stable patient with SVT. The initial dose of adenosine is 0.1 mg per kg. Maximum up to 6 mg. And if there is no response, the heart rate does not improve. You can repeat the dose with 0.2 mg per kg in a subsequent dose, but it will be maximum up to 12 mg. Then question number 50. A child with meningomyelocele was operated with placement of VP shunt. Later, he developed weakness and ataxic gait. The VP shunt is working. What could be the likely malformation? Options given were KRE1, KRE2, epidural abscess and cord differing. Ignore this spelling mistake. So, cord differing. Now, what are the keywords here? The patient, VP shunt dala. Why would VP shunt be put? The patient is having hydrotherapies. Second keyword here is meningomyelocele. And the patient is having weakness and ataxic gait. So, ataxia is happening. What is all the three together? Which malformation you will suspect? You will suspect KRE2 malformations. What is KRE malformation? In Chiari malformation, you will find that there is herniation of cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum. This is the foramen magnum into the cervical canal. It has two types. We have Chiari 1 and Chiari 2. Chiari 1, only the tonsils herniate and the herniation is mild. So, this will manifest in the adulthood period and there will be no hydrocephalus. Or hydrocephalus will be very mild, it will not come to attention. In case of type 2, there will be tonsils herniating, there will be uh, brainstem herniating other than tonsils, there may even be midbrain herniating. And so they will produce hydrocephalus along with spasticity, ataxia, etc. And it has a high mortality unless it is managed surgically. Also remember that type 2 is the form because there is hydrocephalus. This is the form Nelson says that 80% cases of type 2 are associated with meningomyelocele. So now everything is fitting into KRE2 malformation and this is the likely answer, right? They have given a lot of clues. You just need to associate them and reach the correct answer. Other questions and topics to be revised on which a recall unfortunately could not be done at the time of this video. At this recording this video, I did not want to, you know, create questions and uh, you know uh, just for the sake of it but there were questions uh, asked related to neonatal heart block in SME 
NMR, uh, neonatal mortality rate in 2025 health goals, there was a question on Marfan syndrome, vitamin A excess, idiopathic hypercalcemia urea is important, Ketelman syndrome versus chronic diabetic use was asked, so there was the metabolic enthrosis and uh, uh, I don't know, but if you, I have, if you are asked me how will you distinguish between the two, you look at urinary chloride. Urinary chloride uh, more than 20 versus less than 10 will help you in distinguishing between Gitterman and chronic diabetic use. Otherwise, they both have metabolic alkalosis. They both can have hypomagnesemia, hypocalciuria as well. So, they are very difficult to distinguish. So, x-rays were uh, images on NEC and BPD were asked. Vein of gallant malformation, some question was there. NRP showing MR SOPA details was asked. Refractory status epilepticus question was there. Uh, chronic dyserythropoietic anemia versus megaloblastic anemia based on reticulocyte count was asked. So, in case of uh, CDA, especially type 1 CDA, you will have megaloblastic, uh, you will have macrocytic anemia with reticulocytosis, although reticulocytosis will not be in the range as you expect. Megaloblastic anemia, reticulocytosis will not be seen. You will only have macrocytosis. And asymptomatic hypoglycemia and antenatal hydronephrosis also things were asked, so you need to revise these topics. So, what it shows, whatever, if I have to summarize and give you some advice, those who have been patient enough to listen to reach the end of this video. First of all, thank you. And uh, second thing, what are the takeaways that you need to understand? Every specialty is important. You want to be a pediatric cardiologist, great. But that doesn't mean that you neglect endocrinology or you don't like neurology, so you're not going to read that. Every speciality contributes questions and the area which you miss is the area which will doom you in your exam. So every speciality in super speciality is important and with the new pattern coming, it is going to be a very balanced paper. Second thing is questions can be asked and they have been asked from selected pediatric drugs, usually the common drugs that you use, fetal medicine and pediatric surgery in high yield topics. So, CDH surgery, TEF surgery, uh, intersusception surgery, rectal prolapse surgeries, these are the kinds of surgeries, at least the names and what exactly you are doing in each that you need to do. Case-based approach is a must. You can't simply, you know, go through clinical feature, investigation of choice, treatment of choice. No. Try to apply what if the patient is presenting with this, what could be the likely diagnosis and how will you distinguish this particular differential from that particular differential. For example, Wilms tumor versus neuroblastoma, how will you distinguish? Muscular dystrophy of Duchenne versus Becker, how will you distinguish? These are the key points that you should focus when you revise. Nelson contributes to about 60 to 70 percent questions yet. If you look at those past papers, till 2018-19, Nelson would give 90 percent paper. Now, contribution of Nelson has come down, but still it is the bulk. General pediatrics, a lot of questions are asked on Nelson, but in other specialties, there are things which are beyond Nelson as well. So you need to read additional text as well. Only reading Nelson cover to cover will get you a respectable rank, but it may not get you the seat of your choice. Cloherty and Park. If uh, you ask me, sir, what are the other things in addition I need to read? Cloherty and Park. Yes. Then pediatric nephrology and neurology. They are tricky. They are actually difficult questions were asked from these two areas along with some areas of general pediatrics. And imaging findings and visuals are very important. You will find at least five to seven images related to the characteristic features. Although this time cardiology images were not asked, but still the typical snowman appearance, etc. You need to read them. Past and recent MCQ practice is the key. The more you practice recent papers, the, the more topics you identify from where questions have been asked. You will find that there is a pattern. Muscular dystrophy, SMA, Allagilly syndrome, NRP, PALS, SVT. These are the areas from where questions have been asked consistently. The reason you did not do them was because you were not thorough with the important high yield topics. So identify them and read them thoroughly. There is no reason why you should not get selected. All of you are brilliant people. And of the day luck also comes into play. But 100 questions will be there or 150 questions will be there. You need not know everything. Just know a bit more than others. There will always be 10 to 12 questions which are unsolvable. In the others, score well. All the best. You're most welcome to ask for any other advice, any other suggestions that you need from me. And finally, PALS, NRP, latest updates and scoring systems. Uh, I forgot to mention, they will also give you an edge. So, please be thorough with these things as well. So, you're most welcome for any uh, inputs, any uh, advice you need from my side. If you want me to take up some more topics, you're most welcome to suggest that. All the best for your exams.